Australia is facing a climate emergency. At least, if you listen to Anthony Albanese, Chris Bowen, the ABC, The Guardian, and the ALP. But also according to The Teals and Malcolm Turnbull, a multimillionaire who seems intent on greasing the ladder for the rest of us, while also pulling up the ladder behind him. However, Peter Dutton seems to have injected a degree of sanity into the debate. He's acknowledged that it would be great to reduce pollution, and great to reduce carbon emissions, but we must do so in a logical, orderly, and effective manner. Knee-jerk measures that increase the cost of living while also tanking the economy simply aren't going to cut it. He's tried to put forth an alternative that maybe is a little bit more sensible, or at least a little bit more measured, and will hopefully not do too much economic damage in the shift toward having more renewable power or more cleaner energy generation. So to emphasise this contrast, Anthony Albanese and Chris Bowen have brought in several rather harmful policies, all in the sake of addressing climate change. These include, for example, the Ute Tax and the Future Made in Australia Act. The Ute Tax, which I've covered previously, will add thousands of dollars to the cost of many very popular cars, chief amongst which being the Utes, which are some of the largest sellers within Australia. The Future Made in Australia Act also effectively creates another class of companies that are going to be addicted to government subsidies. Companies that would never be viable without these government subsidies. These would include, for example, solar manufacturers, which have no real hope of competing with cheap Chinese goods, but nevertheless the government wants to prop up. Now such companies would only ever really be able to operate if there are government subsidies. Without the government, these companies would simply not be viable. In so doing, the government creates yet another trough at which the pigs of corporate welfare can gorge. The NDAS, for example, leaps to mind as a harbinger of what this leads to. It also makes the business more dependent on government, which one might speculate might be part of the ALP's goal. And in a case, it is not efficient, and it exacerbates inflation, something that all serious economists have specifically stated, contrary to what Jim Chalmers wants to try to make people believe. Now, the ALP has been rather pig-headed in its resistance to things like nuclear, which might, for example, help with the energy transition. Now, nuclear is not perfect. However, it is potentially one part of the energy mix. One might argue that nuclear will never be economically viable. But we should at least explore it. We should at least test it to determine whether it is feasible. It might well not be feasible, but we need to analyse it. At present, the ALP seems intent on not even exploring it, not even doing that analysis. They seem to dogmatically refuse to even consider nuclear. Now, it might well be, like I've indicated, that nuclear won't be viable, and it certainly could take a decade to come online. But the longer we prevaricate, the longer it is going to be. And the ALP, and specifically the Greens in particular, definitely seem to resist nuclear for purely ideological reasons. The ALP also seems to want to shift purely toward renewables very, very quickly. They seem to not want to enable any extension of fossil fuel power plants or any new fossil fuel power plant construction, only to have their hand forced when we face the living prospect of energy shortages. Now, they might clearly want to move toward cleaner energy, and indeed reducing pollution is overwhelmingly a good thing. However, energy generation does not magically appear overnight. You can't shut down a coal-fired power plant and then just hope that renewable energy miraculously appears to replace it. You need to have these things in transition and in plan for quite some time. And you can't just not renew a coal-fired power plant or not build gas generators when you will need those for energy generation. You would need to scale down your reliance on those over time, not just hope that there's going to be some replacement to them when you decide to pull the plug. The ALP and Chris Bowen seem to also be very wedded to the idea of EVs, even though many people seemingly don't want them, especially given the distances that people drive within Australia, and especially given the infrastructure challenges that people face in many of the cities. Now, I dispute whether EVs are genuinely cleaner across their life cycle. And this, for example, could be because many car enthusiasts care for their internal combustion cars for decades, whereas the cost of replacing batteries in EVs is going to be prohibitively expensive. And that same factor would cause to ordinary consumers, not just enthusiasts, prolonging the life of their internal combustion cars relative to that of EVs. Meaning that on a like-for-like -like basis, 
I'm not actually sure that EVs are necessarily cleaner, but even if we accept that they are cleaner, which is a big assumption, but even if we make that assumption, the baseload capacity and infrastructure simply are not there. The charging infrastructure isn't there. Just think about all of the people that live in apartments. Where are they going to charge their EVs? Because oftentimes these apartment blocks don't want EV chargers within the building because EVs have this tendency to catch on fire. And this means that people need to charge their EVs outside, potentially at a shopping center or some other charging station. But there simply aren't enough of them for people to be able to do this. And therefore EVs simply aren't viable in greater numbers. Further, the grid can't tolerate simultaneous charging from a country's worth of EVs at this point in time. We would need to do significant infrastructure upgrades, not just to the charges per se, but to the grid. And EVs at the moment can only operate in part because there are so few of them. Increase that and you'll need more power, you'll need an upgraded grid, and you'll need more charging infrastructure, all of which we simply don't have at the moment, which is why people are very sour on the idea of EVs. No one might argue there's a bit of a chicken and the egg problem. For example, when there aren't enough EVs, the charging infrastructure doesn't get built, etc, etc, etc. And that, to some extent, is an issue. But over time, it could somewhat resolve itself, maybe, albeit very slowly. However, the government is really serious about getting EV uptake. It needs to focus less on subsidies for the EVs themselves, and more on subsidies for the infrastructure to be built out, at least in the short term because it isn't economically viable to build that infrastructure, so it would only ever get done with subsidies, which to some extent has that whole issue I mentioned before of creating a class of companies that are going to be dependent on government largesse. By contrast, we can look at what Peter Dutton is looking at. Now, Peter Dutton's policies are a little bit inchoate at the moment, which is not necessarily ideal, but they give us an idea of where he is heading with his policy setting and the framework he might use to try to set policies when they're fleshed out. In particular, he seemed to realise that Australians are tired of some of the renewable or clean energy push. It's not that Australians necessarily reject the idea of climate change. And indeed, many Australians would like to reduce carbon emissions and would like to reduce pollution in general. But Australians want to be realistic about the transition, the speed and the costs involved. People don't want the government gaslighting them about the cost of renewable transitions. People don't want the government gaslighting them about the desirability of EVs, which they themselves don't really want as manifested in the sales data. They don't want the government trying to pull the wool over their eyes. But unfortunately, some politicians, indeed many politicians, seem to be intent on doing this because they seem to believe that they know better. But in reality, it's oft times that people are failing upwards into politics, which is not exactly ideal if you want good administration. Now to be clear, I've emphasized Peter Dutton so far. Peter Dutton is one part of the Liberal Party, but other parts of the Liberal Party seem to not really know what they stand for. They appear to oscillate back and forth between policy positions. And this is particularly the case at state government level, where you seem to get a mix of policy positions that seem to be a little bit incoherent, which is not a brilliant position for a party to find itself in. And the Liberal Party seems to be at an internal battle over exactly what to do, at least at state level. However, at federal level, Peter Dutton has shown a way forward. He's shown that people can move toward an energy transition, they can move toward cleaner generation, but do so in a sensible manner and take Australians along for the ride, and they can avoid just misleading Australians, which is probably what annoys people the most about this climate crisis rhetoric. Now, of course, there are always going to be people like Malcolm Turnbull or Matt Keane who are sure to criticize Peter Dutton's policy stance, if not in public, then certainly behind closed doors. And Peter Dutton might face a Herculean task to win the next election. But at least he is presenting a bit of a genuine alternative, and at least he is trying to hold the government to account, which is really what you need an opposition to do. His policies might not be perfect, but at least they seem to be a lot better than what we're being presented with by the government at the moment. But otherwise, let me know your thoughts about Peter Dutton's position, Anthony Albanese's position, and that of Chris Bowen, and whether we should be going more aggressively toward renewable energy, or whether Peter Dutton is trying to strike the right balance. I'd be keen to hear what you think.